We will start with Raul Parte from Tech5. Operator, please bring Raul to the stage. Raul, welcome again. Nice to have you with us. You're on mute. Thank you, Luso. Thanks for having us. Great. So, Raul, our audience is anxious to learn if we really can use standard phones to capture usable fingerprints, not just show, just showing them. Can, can, can you give us your expert opinion on this? So the short answer is you can definitely capture fingerprints using a mobile phone with a good camera. The long or more qualified answer is depends on what you plan to do with it. Are you planning to capture fingerprints that are compatible with legacy contact fingerprints? If you have legacy database, if you have legacy algorithms, or are you planning to start up a new program where you want to use that fingerprints to do deduplication and issue unique identities? Okay. The other, sorry, yeah, just one, yeah, yeah, yeah. one more dimension to is that, uh, and what is the total cost of ownership and how wide range of devices you want to be able to use? Okay, so hold on to that thought. So what you've said is yes, but the answer is not a, a binary answer. The answer is it, how effective uh, these images that are captured depends on the context, on the starting point, and on basically um, the application that you intend to use them for. So the good news is there is some set of applications for which today's technology is able to empower using a standard phone. So, so let's, let's stay on that thought. Now, when I say standard phone, is it really any phone or is there a minimum requirement? So um, uh, again, going back to the same answer, the range of phones that you could use uh, depends on the use case. For example, if you were to use a, a phone to enroll a population for deduplication, there is a minimum requirement, which basically can be boiled down to good camera system, when I say good camera system, good resolution, let's say five megapixel camera, good focusing uh, system, the cameras should be able to focus uh, to get the details. And then the last would be is, you know, there is enough lighting conditions or, you know, standard operating procedure uh, that can be implemented on the phone to control certain aspects of the capture process. What? What model phones would you mention? We're not talking iPhone 14 here. Are we talking, well, give, me, give me an example of what phones are you able to use and how much do they cost? So uh, depending on the market availability, uh, we have tested this right going from like a Samsung 6, which is five to seven years old phone. And if I were to source them, depending you know, on the availability, they could go down as $150 uh, per phone. Uh, of course, uh, when you want to do higher population size, good quality, you want to go to the latest phones and which you know are expensive. But it again, depends on the use case and total cost of ownership of the program. Okay, so let, let us talk. You, you mentioned a few times so far the deduplication, which is a big issue because in a lot of cases, you're starting a program, it could be a functional program or foundational program, you're trying to enroll the population and you want to be able to do it in as easily as possible. Perhaps instead of sending equipment to the field, you send an operator or you use somebody in the village who may have um, uh, uh, to download a software and be able to submit uh, image images for enrollment. Um, give us an idea about what realistic size programs can we think of doing. Are we talking about 50,000 people or are we talking 3 million people? So um, based on our current internal benchmarking, and of course, uh, we are also resorting to some of the external benchmarks that are going on. Uh, I would, uh, with my own expert, expert opinion and the team, claim that we could implement a program for a country with 50 million population. Uh, mm -hmm. using a mid-range to a higher range phone uh, and pre-calibrated software and standard operating procedure where operators or somebody is trained with good guidance on how to capture the fingerprints. Now, one right. thing that I will add is that, of course, you can get really good accuracy, uh, including multimodal 
approach. Uh, and of course, in a phone, it's pretty standard. And we looked at what face has done. You can capture face and voice. Uh, and if you include these modalities, you can achieve a really good program uh, and results uh, using just a smartphone. So do you really think that the days of carrying big suitcases with enrollment kits and going into the field, let's say for um, a program to do uh, voter registration, those days um, may be numbered. I mean, it could be several years, but and, and you see an end and light at the end of the tunnel. Yes, I do. Uh, I personally, and I've been saying this since last year, and we have seen some uh, progress in that direction. And uh, as, as I keep saying that there are two components to a fingerprint capture. One is, are you capturing something that is compatible with legacy fingerprints? And right. I think our, you know, our colleagues at NIST are going to talk about it and what standardization means. But we have also learned from uh, the previous presentation what AI is doing to it. So what happens with the cell phone, you're not only capturing the traditional feature sets of the fingers, you're also capturing something more. So if you are ready to uh, adopt new AI-based finger recognition technologies, this uh, statement would stand true in a very near future that you will not require any more uh, you know, purpose-built devices, if you will. Okay, L let's drill on this. You, you said something very interesting, which is legacy. Um, are we talking about minutia-based fingerprint algorithms? By, by, by that's what you mean by legacy? Yes, uh, minutia-based algorithms and fingerprints that were captured using either ink or the slab, you know, live scans uh, or contact scanners. Right, but let me ask you, is it a question of legacy imaging or legacy information that we left behind? For example, when I do a fingerprint capture, even on a contact device, and I kept the image itself, or am, am I able to go back and use AI to re-template that and go beyond minutiae and capture other information that the minutiae algorithms simply ignore because they, they were never built to do anything beyond the minutiae? Yeah, um, and that's what we are taking the approach of, is that when we are developing AI-based algorithms, and I'm sure some people, are, some other vendors are doing, we do build algorithms that are compatible with these legacy images, for sure. But at the same time, uh, when we are capturing this uh, new set of images using contactless finger uh, uh, technologies, we are building the algorithms to take the added advantage of more information that is captured using a cell phone. That is the shape of the fingers, the geometry and the creases. And you can see there is a lot more information in a cell phone picture of the fingerprints compared to your legacy images you captured right. in contact. So, so the point here is that uh, human skin has got a lot more structure and morphology and information than just uh, fingerprints. And as a result, it's very important to keep in mind that when we talk about opening up the future uh, and, and enabling contactless fingerprints to work, you are talking about enabling a completely new set of biometrics, not just an imaging technique. Is that correct? It's exactly correct, yes. Okay, so we are basically entering into a new world where there's more information being extracted out of the, of the fingerprints. And that's happening because um, AI is able to, to extract that type of information, um, et cetera. Okay, um, so one to end, um, you're reasonably comfortable that in the near future, we should be able to go into the field and for let's say a social protection program or a humanitarian assistance program, we could be taking um, and enrolling people in the field using medium to high end phones uh, with fingerprint and face. So maybe 20 million, 50 million, that is not out of the question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, um, let's go back to an easier problem. What about the one-to-one? One-to-one, problem using authentication, using fingerprints. Of course, we know the selfie one-to-one -one is really working very well. Uh, so, so talk to us about what's the status of the one-to-one -one authentication using fingerprints? Yeah, I, in that case, I'll be bold enough to say that th that problem is already solved. Uh, the, the accuracy that you can achieve for a one-to-one -one is extremely high because you have more uh, room to work with the algorithm tolerance uh, because when you capture the fingerprints, the main issue being the scale of the fingerprints, 500 DPI versus, you know, uh, that you don't know. So we have 
many life programs in Latin America. Uh, in fact, we are, ourselves have two life programs in Africa that are used for, uh, you know, know your customer EKYC approaches. And it's technology is you, capturing technology is our technology, but the back end is somebody else. So we are also addressing interoperability. And with one to one, you already always have the opportunity to retry. So I think from my perspective, a one to one is a very easy problem and it's already been solved using this technology. Okay, we're going to continue the discussion, but I want to take a couple of questions from the audience. Um, Edson Pereira asks uh, to Dr. Raul Parte, the software to capture the image is affordable, that's a question, to incorporate storage and deduplicate uh, those fingerprints in an own application, is that easy? What is the general cost? I mean, just, just give an idea relative to the context. Well, I know it's difficult to give any numbers, but is this going to be more expensive, same, less? Where are we? So the, the smart way to answer that would be is your total cost of ownership. So if in the old days, if you're creating an enrollment kit, you would buy a, a separate camera, a cell phone, a, a fingerprint sensor, and more sense, uh, you know, other acquisition sensors for voice and iris. In this case, you would just invest in a hardware that is a phone, and then the software component of it will basically be an added on cost. I can pretty much say that the program cost will be still less compared to a purpose-built devices and scanners uh, from the past. And then second part of the question is storage and deduplication. Uh, as you can imagine that uh, with a phone, you can only do so much. So phones would essentially become a, a capture point and a small deduplication data set. But if you have a large population, you will have to send them to the back end where you'll have a bigger system to you know, do the deduplication itself. And, and in principle, you could send either the, um, the images themselves or you could send an extracted set of templates from the contactless print that you captured. In, in, in theory, yes. Uh, but of course, we always recommend to send the images to the back end the image uh, as much as possible, yes. In, in order to, to basically allow for future proofing as the algorithms improve. Okay, uh, how big are the images um, that you're sending? Just to get an idea about the transmission in some areas in Africa, for example, uh, image transmission might be an issue. How big are these images? So um, again, uh, depending on what uh, you'll agree on the compression sizes, of course, they are gonna be bigger than your typical uh, WSQ okay. images contact images. But as we said, uh, what we do is we do extract the images in two forms. One is a WSQ image and one is the original image. So what you could do is that you will send the WSQ or traditional images online, whereas you could take an archive of the, the bigger fingerprint images and then do it offline mechanism, if you will. Okay. You, when you sync somewhere with the Wi-Fi or something, you're able to, to do it. Okay. Right. Um, <clears throat> I mean, Raul, you are uh, a scientist with the impeccable uh, credibility. I've known you, I don't know what, 25 years. Uh, you've worked with me. Uh, you worked in India. You worked in, in many places. But some people may be skeptical about what you're saying. Um, do you have any um, benchmarks that you can share with us that validate this sense of excitement about the fact that contactless fingerprints are very, very potentially successful? Sure, I, let me share a few slides, if you allow me. Yes, please. Um, let me know when you're able to see that and I can... Yeah, we're seeing it. Okay, so let me do uh, two things. Uh, one is that we did an independent uh, benchmark. We, uh, there is a lab called Big Slab uh, out of Australia. They are a NIST or NV Lab accredited laboratory. We had them do an independent test. In this case, they uh, took our software, capture software, uh, with two different phone models, an iOS and Android. They collected uh, subjects, uh, you know, fingerprints with different uh, categories. There is a detailed report about the demographics and all this stuff. But to get to the point, uh, you can see that the FAR and FRR in a one-to-one -one use case uh, is, is presented over here. And you can see that it is contactless to contactless, right? So at you're missing 6.2% if you're using only one finger, which is mm. you know, not true in a, in a national ID program or a large scale program because you'll capture more. 
The other uh, graph you will see is the contactless two contact, which means one uh, set was captured using contact and then the other one is contactless. You see that the error rates have reduced, but the Actually, more- uh, Rahul, sorry, Rahul, we, don't, we don't see the, the contactless, the contact. Uh, did you, where, where are the two graphs? So, sorry, I changed the screen. Uh, contactless ah, okay. to contact, these are the error rates. Right. And if I go to the next one, the error okay. rates are dropped. Uh, okay. And again, this was independently done. Only one finger at a time was compared. So of course you can imagine that the error rates are higher. They get really good when you compare many fingers at the time. Mm -hmm. So to prove a bigger data set, uh, what we did is we took, a, we conducted our internal benchmark and you can see that uh, we took a database of 3 million people. These are 10 prints captured using legacy systems and it's a mix of flats and rolls, which means you know criminal versus civil booking uh, captures. Then the ground truth was basically 184 contactless 10 prints and then same number of people with uh, contact uh, scanners uh, of the shelf. And for the contact data set, we, about, we have about 3.5 thousand uh, people with their 10 prints. We mixed these with the 3 million people database. So you can imagine that the database is big enough to do some statistically significant benchmarking. The technology we use for benchmarking uh, um, was a combination of an AI-based algorithm plus a traditional approach to filter those. To talk about some of the results, uh, you can see that if you take the one to N identification approach, now this is not necessarily relevant to a civil ID program, but let's say you were doing a, a one to end search for a criminal investigation. Uh, what we have seen is that if you use eight fingers, which are two slaps captured, you know, one after the other, or 10 fingers, slap, slap, and one each, more than 99% of the times you will get the person on rank one, which means you will find the right person, even in a size of 3 million people or 30 million fingerprints. Now we are able to take that further and add a modality like face or voice to get absolutely you know, a good uh, result in terms of uh, identification. Now, Rahul, uh, stay back on that, on that graph. What is the gap, just for the benefit of the audience, what is the gap at eight fingers between, between the um, contact uh, and the contactless? Okay, good, good that you pointed out and I forgot. Yes, uh, you can see that the purple graph is the contact, which pretty much is very close to zero error rate. But then uh, when you look at the contact, it is 99% and more as you go more. But it is very competitive if you put every aspect of the ease of capture and the total cost of ownership, that this error rate gap that you see is, um, is okay when you're talking about these ID4D uh, programs. Okay. okay, thanks. Um, when you're talking about a national ID program, the bigger, uh, uh, you know, the main question is how does it perform when you are, uh, you know, when you're capturing, uh, let's say the fingerprints and actually doing deduplication. So we did a study again with the same 3 million population uh, used plus the mixed, uh, you know, contact, contactless. Here you can see that we have done three graphs. One is a contact to contact, uh, which means all people are using, you know, contacted fingerprints both times. One is contact less to contact, which means once is scanner, once is selfie. And then the last one is contactless to contactless. As you can see that with the traditional, you have really good uh, scores uh, or accuracy, but the accuracy for a contactless to contactless is not too far. It's 0.8%. It's still a lot of room for improvement. And one thing that I will highlight is that this was using a traditional approach of matching, even though we have the information to use more. If you use all the information that we had, these curves uh, or the contactless to contactless would perform really um, you know, good. Now, if you look at it from a deployment perspective, what does this mean? Yeah? That you had 992 people, duplicate people who are trying to get a duplicate ID out of a thousand would be caught if you are only using fingerprints, yeah? and which is not true, right? Because we'll always use something else. And one after 10,000 people will be falsely matched. So if I take a 50 million population country, and if you take a rule of thumb of, you know, one to 2% people will try to get a fraudulent ID, uh, you know, uh, intentionally try it. 
we'll definitely see that uh, you know out of the 5 million or you know people or so only 4 to 5 million people will get duplicate ids a uh, 4 to 5000 will get duplicate ids again uh, i have to very be careful the saying that if you are only using fingerprints if you then augment this with face and voice or face plus voice or iris this error rates will be significantly go uh, down and i would be uh, confident to say it will be a successful deployment of the program based on these large scale programs that you know we've been doing mm-hmm. one last slide i would talk about is this is from a, another uk agency which has been doing independent tests uh, unfortunately i cannot mention a lot of details but this talks about the uniformity of your performance across the devices this is the software that we propose and these are other vendors so you can see that's uh, the you these are the phone models like a Galaxy Pixel, Samsung A12. Some of them are old, some of them are new, iPhones. And you can see that the performance across the devices also seems to be uh, uniform, which is great because that is what I think is important to give that uh, democratized uh, you know, uh, approach of uh, capture sensors. Exactly. 